Welcome to episode 57 of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, your host Sam Nita, full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we get into the commercial side of the game, speaking to Bob Hope, uh, the current commercial director of the BBL. But a lot more than that, has been involved with the game for over 40 years, um, uh, mainly on the off-court side of things, in the marketing, sales, commercial side of things. And that's why, for me, it's particularly interesting I'll tell you how this conversation came about. Um, I'm actually writing an article at the moment about the founding of the BBL. And so I reached out to Bob and just said, oh, I've heard you're involved. Are you interested? Uh, can you ask, answer a few questions for me? And he said, oh, there's a lot here. Like, you know, let's jump on a call and you can kind of take notes. If that's all right. And then I was like, well, actually, if you're happy to, let's turn it into a podcast. So that was kind of how the podcast came about. But it actually ended up being, you know, a bit more expanded than that. Went into way more than just the founding of the BBL. Um, but also, you know, his early sort of involvement in the game, uh, the National League in, in those days before the BBL was formed, and then kind of what he's done since, and then sort of the commercial state of the league today, um, you know, TV deals, sponsorship deals, all that kind of good stuff, a few little exclusive nuggets that were dropped in there. Um, but yeah, super interesting. So I hope you'll enjoy it. As always, before we get into the show, uh, please check out our Patreon account, uh, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash h-o-o-p-s-f-i-x there you can sign up to give us a monthly contribution or as much of as much or as little as you'd like to help support the work that we're doing for the price of a cup of coffee you can help support independent media British basketball stuff to help grow um, what we're doing far and wide so please go and check out our Patreon account uh, at patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix if you're listening on iTunes uh, please take two seconds to give us a rating and review if you're watching on YouTube please subscribe leave a comment below let us know your thoughts and if you want to reach out to me personally uh, you can reach out on every single social media platform at HoopsFix or you can drop me an email if you prefer to do it in private sam at HoopsFix.com I reply to every single one anyway that is enough from me here is this week's show episode 57 of the HoopsFix podcast with me and BBL commercial director Bob Hope Bob welcome to the show thank you so as I was as I was saying before we start recording, kind of how how we got here is I'm I'm doing a lot of research at the moment about the the founding of the BBL and how it first came to be, and uh, yeah, found out that you were were heavily involved. So um, made sense that rather than just doing a private conversation for for me to fill out the research, but I actually you know record the whole thing as a podcast, and I think it gives us an opportunity to talk about a bunch of other stuff, um, which isn't just limited to the founding of the BBL, but you know you've obviously been involved for for a very long time obvious place to start um is kind of how you first got involved with with basketball in the first place <clears throat> oh that's simple um so i went to a uh, a school in coventry in the outskirts of coventry a place called exhall the school was ash green high school and i excelled in sports so i was on all the sports teams from athletics to cross country to football to cricket to gymnastics to basketball but the main sports that came out of that was gymnastics. And I became uh, an international school's gymnast. And <clears throat> when leaving school uh, at the age of 16, uh, I started going traveling to Birmingham to have gymnastic coaching in Birmingham. And then as normal happens in gymnastics, you get injured. <clears throat> so I got injured and my parents were struggling to pay the fee for me to get to Birmingham on a twice a week so I wanted to go back into basketball which was my second favorite sport so there was no teams around so I started an old boys team and we called it Exor Eagles and we used to play in the Warwickshire League and uh, it was Coventry Warwickshire League it was in those days and because I was the secretary I had to go to the Warwickshire annual AGM every year and one year I stood up and said, can you explain to me why the Warwickshire team goes to the inter-county championships and never wins a game? And the chair of the meeting at the time said, uh, excuse me, what's your name? I said, oh, it's Bob Hope. And he said to the crowd of about 80 people, I'd like to propose Bob Hope becomes the new county coach for Warwickshire, which shocked, shocked me a bit. But I said to him, OK, I'll take that job on if you pay for me to go to Lillyshaw for two weeks coaching training, which they agreed. I remember I shared a room with Stuart Story at Lily Shaw, who then went on to become a TV commentator for BBC on athletics and basketball. So I came back, uh, thought I knew everything about coaching basketball, got a team together, but my forte was in marketing and sales. So I got this team together. 
I got Adidas to sponsor the team. I got Coventry City football bus to provide as the coach to get to Loughborough for the Intercounty Championships. So we looked really the dog's bollocks when we arrived. We looked professional. So we started to play and unfortunately we didn't win a game. So I was a bit humiliated. So it goes back to the AGM and I said, <clears throat> give me one more year. And I said, OK, fine, have a year. So Coventry is twinned with Volgograd in Russia because Volgograd and Coventry was blitzed in the war. I saw that the mayor of Volgograd was visiting Coventry and there was a reception being given at the Coventry Council House. And as I was the county coach, I managed to talk my way in, got in front of the mayor and said, I'm the coach for basketball. I'd like to challenge Volgograd to a basketball competition. And she accepted it. She said, if you can get to Presswick in Scotland with your team, we'll pay all the expenses from there on. And they, we got up there, we flew out by Aeroflot into Moscow, down to Volgograd, and eventually went to Leningrad. But what I did, I went to the top players in the country, and this is back in the 1970s, and said, do you want a two weeks paid, all expenses paid trip to Russia on the condition you sign to play for me when we get back? And I got a team together. We played in Russia. We played five or six games. I think we only won two. We beat the Volga Tractor Factory on an outdoor court with about 3,000 people watching. So then we go to the Intercounty Championships and came back with the trophy. We won. And that was my last 14 to the Intercounty Championships. So I took the trophy back to Warwickshire and then decided, let's make this team into a more professional outfit and apply to get into the National League at that time. So we had a team, we needed money. I approached a company called Granwood who make flooring for sports halls, who said they would sponsor us. And we then, in those days, to get into the National League, you had to go to the National Invitation Tournament and compete with the bottom two in the league and any others that are trying to get in. And it's obviously the top one or two then get invited. So we go to this tournament. It was in Deeside in North Wales and came back with the trophy. Uh, so we had now managed to succeed to get through the National Invitation Tournament, win it, and we're now in the National League. And that's how it started for me, getting into basketball. So the there was obviously never a, a real interest in pursuing the the playing side of things. It was kind of you you were involved of, in the in the off side off the, off off court things uh, from from the start. I guess one of the, one of the questions I just wanted to quickly ask before we move forward is is the you know you talk about sort of attracting sponsorship and you, you pretty much didn't have a team uh, and you were able to get people involved get sponsors involved. Like what were you selling? Like what was the actual selling point of like of how you got them to sort of part with their money and be involved with a club that didn't really exist at that point and didn't have a long history of, of, of doing things? Well, I wasn't selling them the, the steak. I was selling them the sizzle. So I was trying to sell them um, what the opportunities would be and what the exposure could be for their brand. And bear in mind, you know, the National League had only been going for a couple of years, so it was fairly new. But we felt if I could get a team around me, and I did, I brought in a, a guy called Mike Maddox, who became our PR man. He, he eventually ended up doing commentary on television for Channel 4. We brought in a Terry Donovan, who was um, a statistician, but he worked for in the marketing department of Land Rover. And then we brought in an accountant, Roger Burton, who became the chief accountant for Birmingham City Council. So I had a quite a good team around me. And... Um, you're right. I wasn't really that much good as a player. At five foot six, it was a bit difficult to get anywhere. But I loved to play, and I just saw really opportunities and excitement in being involved in in this game and taking it forward. When you looked around the rest of the national league, uh, what did you see? Kind of what was the lay of the land? Did you feel that uh, you could provide a lot of value and do things bigger and better than than other teams were doing at the time? Yes, I did. I used to go to a number of games. I used to go up to Loughborough All-Stars on a Saturday to watch them play. I would go and watch any of the England games playing. So I looked at it and then thought, well, 
we can do better than this. They're doing it well, but on an amateur basis. And I thought we could take this to the next level. And at just at the same time, Coventry was building a brand new sports complex right in the city centre. And I'd been in to talk to the city council and we'd agreed a deal that we could use this facility to promote the work, the Coventry. Um, so it was really the passion that would drive me in whatever I do today. It has to be professional. It has to be the best and I have to do the best. So what year was it that you founded Granwood? I've got my list here, actually. It would be in 1974. 1974 and kind of what was the progression of, of the club from from that point onwards well the the fact we we got into the league in fact that first year we came fifth in the league and we were up against the big rivals there was crystal palace there was embassy from milton Keynes, there was manchester there was doncaster so we were up against some decent teams but what happened in those earlier days was that these national league teams went to the inter-county championships as a county so Doncaster would go as Yorkshire and and therefore you were coming up against these National League teams at this quite a high level competition that was run on a Friday Saturday Sunday at Loughborough using three courts um, so I could see what the competition was I knew what we had to do and my coaching philosophy changed I was no longer a coach that could take young talent and develop it quickly it doesn't work that way for me it, young talent develops over a period of years with hard work my philosophy changed get the best and let them play and that's what i started to do and that's what i found out you could do with offering the players an incentive like a free trip two weeks two weeks in russia that's what we did so get the best let them play that's always been my philosophy so what, what explain that the the inter county thing I haven't actually he heard that before like what, explain that a little bit like what was it so that was so you essentially you had the national league <clears> and then you had an inter county tournament that ended up being the national league clubs that represented as the counties what was the point of the of the county tournament Well the county tournament had been going on for a number of years before the national league started so the the country was divided into counties so you you'd have Warwickshire would send it into the county championships. You'd have Middlesex, Essex, Kent, whoever, uh, from their federation, their local federation, sends a team to the county championships. It was run by a guy called Alan Hodgkinson, who ran it for years and did a really good job doing it. But it became so competitive that the counties wanted to win it. And the way they could win it is taking the National League team and just rebrand it as Surrey, and go to the tournament so it became a really interesting and competitive tournament and that that took place over a single weekend during the season at the start of the season uh, it was at the end of the season it was around uh april may time and it was on a friday saturday sunday at love so you'd arrive on the friday you'd start playing games on the friday night throughout saturday and then the final would be like on the sunday afternoon and so where did um, the National Federation sit in amongst all of this at, at this point? Like, uh, was that was that run by the Federation or was the Federation just running the National <coughs> League? Like, No. So in those days, the Federation was um, England basketball, not basketball England as it is today. So it was England basketball. Um, the competition director or secretary was Alan Hodgkinson. So it was his brainchild to bring together a county championships. And so it was overseen by um, the office, which was in Leeds in those days of England basketball. OK, so one of the things I, I noticed in your notes um, was this uh, AGM in 1979. Um, yeah. So. Can you explain like exactly what that was and, and what happened in it? OK, so we've been playing in the league uh, for a few years and the clubs um, really were not in control of their own destiny. And the league was attracting sponsorships. I mean, we had the Clark's men's shoes. We had rotary watches that were coming into the league. And at the end of the year, the league, the top four teams would go to like 
the championship finals at Wembley, where on a Friday night it would be sold out, 12,000 people. And then on the Saturday afternoon, the final live on BBC Grandstand, 12,000 people there. So there's a lot of money coming in. All the clubs got was expenses. We got a hotel room for the Friday night and we got the cost of a bus to get to Wembley. So there's a number of the people involved and there was primarily myself and David Last from Crystal Palace. Then we brought in Maurice Wordsworth from Doncaster and we said, look here, guys, we're the show. They're putting it on and we're getting nothing out of this. So we want to control our own destiny. So it started that we started talking to England basketball about this and they would have none of it. They were not going to relinquish control. We thought about doing a breakaway, but there were so many constraints they could put onto us. One, we wouldn't be able to get referees. Any player wouldn't be able to represent their country. And it got nasty. So we sat down with the club owners and said, OK, well, let's attack this from within. And in those days, the annual general meeting, if any player who is registered with England basketball has a vote at the AGM, so this one year, and the, it was in the De Vere Hotel in Coventry, was the AGM, and the chairman at the time was Ken Charles, who had been the chair for a number of years, well-respected person. We decided we were going to go up against him and vote. So we took an independent guy called Harry Keats, who was an international referee from London, not associated with a club, so we, we wanted to be squeaky clean. So what we did, each club involved either brought a minibus or a full bus of players to the AGM. We had over 100 players in this room at the AGM. And all it does, when they come up to vote for the chair, they were told that when Bob Hope puts his hand up, they all put the hand up. So the vote went something like 120 to 30 in favour of us changing the chair. So we changed the chair that sent shockwaves through England basketball because once we attacked it from the top end now we can go in and start negotiating from strength which is what we did so what happened from that point on with with the so they had to then change the chair who did they bring in was that someone that you had said that this is who we want or like how did that work after that no we proposed Harry Keats to, as the chair against Ken Charles we won the vote he became the chair so now, and Harry wasn't, people would say, well, he's your puppet. But, you know, he was working for us to get things changed from within. So he was now the chair of the board. So we want to have a league all on our own where we can control our own destiny. We can control our TV exposure, the income coming in, and it's divided equally within the teams. And that's what we were after. Okay, so this was 1979. Now, as we know, the BBL wasn't actually founded until 1987. So there was another eight years that, that uh, clearly things didn't go as planned um, or, or not what you wanted. So kind of what happened in those eight years, and I guess what didn't happen that you wanted to happen that sort of then ended up leading to you having to almost, well, to break away and, and, and form the BBL? Well, in the, we started negotiating with them and we had regular meetings on a monthly basis where club owners and particularly myself from Coventry Stroke Birmingham and David Lass from Crystal Palace would attend these meetings and we would negotiate and this is what we want to do. Um, England basketball were slow in whatever they did. They didn't want to release this uh, really a little diamond gem that they'd start to cultivate. They didn't want that to go and it, it took a number of years to get over it. They gradually relented and that we started to get prize money from going to the the championships at Wembley we started to get a percentage of uh, sponsorship money that was coming in so I think their tack was let's feed them bits of uh, of food to to make them think well we're getting there and they'll just be happy and continue to go but no, the bigger picture was we needed to control our own destiny and an example was that I felt they were trying to buy us off. Uh, I became the general manager of the Great Britain's Olympic team in for the 80 and 84 Olympic qualifying. And um, 
in those days, you didn't get money from the government. We raised it, but that was my forte. I went out, those teams were fully kitted out with Adidas equipment. We had a deal with Hepworth Taylors. The whole team traveled in suits and ties and shirts. It was totally funded and um, we were able to do really interesting things. In 1980, uh, 1980 Norm Sloan uh, was the head coach of the Great Britain team and Norm had just come off winning the NCAA championships with North Carolina. So we went to Florida for six weeks training and then came back and toured Europe and all that we funded through sponsorships and uh, and it worked very well and it just showed the players they were looked after they never we never stayed in a hotel less than a holiday in because I needed them to feel they'd been looked after and that's what we did so when when like when to get into the nitty-gritty of the details like let's just say that for example you know Basque England uh, were to sign a, a deal England basketball were to sign a deal worth ten thousand pounds um, kind of how was that what was the split that they were then <clears throat> dividing in amongst the clubs what were they keeping and from the club's points of view like what what did how much did you want like uh kind of where where were the points of of tension well the point of tension was they wanted to keep as much as they could and they <laughs> kept saying well we needed to develop grassroots basketball and we're saying but we needed to develop this professional league to take the sport further and it, it did get into some nasty arguments where people did walk out of some meetings. So it did take a while, but eventually they got to the stage where they're not going to be able to stop us. We are so determined to make this happen and go through. And what they did was uh, I gave up coding in the National League around, oh, what was it? Let me just check. It was 1983. Yeah. So... They asked me to go and work for them. They set up a company called Basketball Marketing Limited, BML. And they said to me, would I come in and oversee the marketing and sponsorship? Which I did. Uh, the chairman at the time was a guy called Gordon Wasserman, who is now Lord Wasserman, who is on the all-party committee for basketball. So we set off and started uh, selling and bringing in uh, TV contracts. Peter Sprogis was involved, um, bringing in various contracts on television, and I was bringing in the sponsorship ones. And I think that the idea of England basketball was to show the, the league that, look, we've got the resources, we've got the expertise now, we're bringing the money in, why do you want to break away? And it still we kept coming back, we need to control our own destiny. So that worked for a period of time till eventually England basketball said, OK, we'll let you go. There were certain rules about what we could do, what we couldn't do, which we accepted. It's a bit like today with the, the BBL. So it was agreed that uh, we could set up our own league, but it had to be done properly. It had to be done professionally. And that's why it took us probably two years to get the thing in place. Um, for it to happen in 87. Couldn't there have been said that, you know, you're still talking like you're representing the clubs, but actually you were working for a company that was representing Basketball England. Didn't they see that as a potential conflict of interest there? They did uh, in, in the first place, but then uh, it was always, I said to the clubs that if we do break away, BML can be dissolved and I'll become the commercial manager for the league. And it would be easy to just move the same contracts. So we had a contract with Carlsberg or Prudential, and I could just move them across to the BBL, which is what we did. Um, also, I, in my coaching role as well, I was no longer a professional coach, but I used to take an all-star team to Gibraltar every year in the 80s. And that was for guaranteed gate money. We used to, they used to have a huge tournament bringing in Spanish first division teams. And we used to take an all-star team to Gibraltar. Um, I used to take teams to the States to play the NCAA Division I universities. Guaranteed gates would come back with pockets full of dollars, which we didn't know what to do with in the end. Uh, we had so much of it. So it was for me I, to sell to the clubs because I'd been part of the clubs. I'd been part of it growing up. And then I'd branched off to go and do what I felt was more specialist, which was um, 
doing the marketing and bringing in sponsorships. So the clubs accepted that. And a lot of these clubs were friends of mine anyway, so they agreed to it. So the point when it when it started becoming real that, okay, you're going to break away, um, <laughs> you know, how, how did that process happen? One of the uh, people that I spoke to um, when I was also doing research about the founding of the BBL was, was Angie um, from Murray Livingston. And she was talking about the, she remembers the, um, the first meeting that was kind of when it started becoming real. She was sent down um, as the representative from from uh, Scotland, um, and she said it, she says she remembers it being in a hotel near Heathrow, like a, it was like a kind of secretive meeting. Like, do you can you kind of remember that and sort of uh, yeah, what the what the stages are, what, what what happened when it started becoming a reality? Yes, um, they were secret meetings because we needed to have a a plan together that we could argue with England basketball um, about where we wanted this to go. So we would have these secret meetings at various hotels around Heathrow so she could fly in or David Murray could fly in and, and yeah. talk to us. And that was really how it started. But the, the BBL started um, in 87. I don't think at that stage Murray International were part of it. I can't remember exactly. So I think the story was that they weren't officially uh, part of it in the first season, but they were involved in the schedule. So teams would play friendlies against them because it was known that they were going to be a part of it because she was saying that it was clear that... um, you know, the teams in the National League wanted them to be a part of it so it could be a British basketball league. And for that to happen, they needed a non-English team. So I think it was the next season they officially joined. But in the first season, they were unofficially a part of it, but not a part of it, if you know what I mean. It's just friendlies. Yeah, well, the problem there, you see, is we were negotiating with England basketball. So they had no authority over Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland. So the fact that we wanted Murray in, and I got to know David Murray really well when he was getting involved um, was a problem. So the only way we could get them in was take the league as the BBL to start it going. And then we are then controlling our own destiny. And after year one, we can expand and bring in a team from Scotland um, with the approval of the Scottish Federation. But at the, in the first place, Basketball England had no authority to to agree for us to bring in a Scottish team. So what were the permissions that you needed from England Basketball? Kind of, You went to them and you said, look, this is the proposal. We've got these teams. We're all going to break away. We want to break away. Kind of, Did it work now where it's like there's a license that they had to give you to be the professional league in this country? Kind of, What was the, sort of the, the intricacies of it? Um, there wasn't a license. We may have had a, some form of a contract or an agreement. It wasn't a license like we have now. Um, what, what it was, was we, it was a detailed what we would do, how we would promote grassroots basketball, how we would support the referees. They were providing all the referees for all of the games. So they were doing the development program for the refereeing. Um, But we took all the sponsorship away from them. So they felt they were losing a lot lot of money. But if if we didn't play, they wouldn't get any money anyway. So it was chicken and egg. If you need us, we can support you. We need to run our own and have our own destiny. Did you say that you would give them a portion of any of the sponsorship money that that you got? Like, I think right now there's a payment for the license fee, right? Like, that's, there's actually a cost to that, which which goes to the federation. So, were you giving them kickbacks on <clears throat> on any deals that you signed, or, or was it literally like you're just taking you're taking away, you know, a massive chunk of their revenue and and going going rogue? <laughs> yeah, you know, we didn't give them any money back, as far as I know. Wow. Um, but but without us, they hadn't got anything to sell. And therefore, we um, felt we were the show in town. We wanted to control it. And politically, it was heavy going to get this through. Uh, you know, and it was a gun to the head. If they didn't do it, we'll go anyway and suffer the consequences, which is our plan wasn't to do that. It, we wanted to get the approval, so it all went through smoothly. What was there? Was I remember. It, yeah, go I, on. I, Sorry. I'm going to say I remember we when we started. One of the first board meetings was in the boardroom at Manchester United Football Club. It was chaired by Martin Edwards, who was the chairman of the football club at the time. I remember Maurice Watkins was there. 
I was there, Kevin Routledge was there, and some others that I don't remember. Um, but it was an interesting concept that we were gone from a secret hotel rooms to now we're in the boardroom of Manchester United, which was a bit special. There must have been some pretty heated uh, arguments, conversations with basketball England. Kind of what was their, you know, what was their, um, I guess, counter arguments to try and convince you not to, or was it had they very much just accepted it? Like, yeah, how how did that go down? No, the, we had protracted arguments over the years about uh, what we could do. What we tried to do and to have the neutral side was this BML, Basketball Marketing Limited, which was set up to handle the TV and sponsorship coming into the league. And the league would have people sitting on that board. So there was representatives of the league and England basketball on that board. So until the league broke away, that board could decide where the dividend of monies was going. So that was a compromise they came up with. Before that company was set up, we had no say. It was totally closed shop. How long, uh, so when you switched, when you sort of formed the BBL, did Basketball Marketing Limited stay as part of no. the, no, what happened there? No, it ceased. It, that The idea was that would cease and I'd been working on that. Then I would move to uh, the BBL and in fact, I remember the first chief exec of the BBL was a guy called Dave Clark, um, which in the time, the Dave Clark Five and Bob Hope, it was like superstars moving into the sport. But we we had a, an office in Sutton Coalfield over, a, I think it was over a newspaper shop. And that's where it, it started. And, um, and I also think that somebody called Rob Webb, who's Andy Webb's brother, came in on the PR side to start working with us as well. So that way it all started. But it was fairly easy to move contracts that we'd had with um, Basketball Martin Limited. I just went to see the people and said, hey, it's no longer this. We're doing this. And uh, and, and it went ahead that way. Wow. The um, one thing before we sort of move on from Basketball Marketing Limited is that I did note that you know, uh, they'd raised sponsorship of over seven million. Um, with you know, and I look at some of the the companies that are listed, and you've got Just Juice, Carlsberg, Adidas, NatWest. You know, a pretty impressive um, roster of of, <clears throat> of sponsorships. Kind of, how did that happen? You know, how does that compare to today? I guess like it seems like just the sponsorship market was so much richer uh, back in those times compared to today. Um, yeah, like, what would you say are the main differences between then and now? The main differences, I don't think there is much of a main difference. What they invested in was the enthusiasm that I went to meet them. If I could get in to see them, I would usually come out with something. A classic example was I went to see NatWest Bank about sponsoring the National Cup. And they said, look, Bob, we'd love to do it. We've got... Uh, all we could fund is £10,000. So I accepted that, went back to the board and said, look, this has got potential to run. And in fact, I've still got the cheque. It's a, it's a large cheque and it's got £10,000 on made out to uh, Basketball Marketing Limited. Within year three, they were paying 120000 for the same competition. So it was... I believe in any sponsor coming into this sport, bring them in uh, on a small basis and let them put the toe in the water. Let them see the excitement. In fact, I have another classic example. Just two years ago, um, a company called Benecost, which is a German cosmetics company, uh, had been sponsoring netball, the netball league, or one of the teams in the netball super league, fallen out with netball. And then I the MD approached me and said, can we have a chat? I met him two or three times in London. He said, I'm not sure if we should get into this. And I said, well, look, put your toe in the water. Let's do it this way. We've got the playoffs coming off at, uh, at the O2 uh, in two or three months' time. Just commit to that. Let's call it the Benny Coss basketball playoffs at the O2 for a small amount of money. And I said, then you can have the option of becoming the official cosmetics supplier for the BBL and the WBBL. 
So it's okay. So he committed, paid his money. Half time of the final at the O2, he came up to me and our chairman, Sir Rodney Walker, and he said, Bob, this is unbelievable. I love it. I'm in for the next three years. And that was how I try and get people in. Don't go in with a heavy sell and then stitch them up for big sums of money. Bring them in on a slowly basis and let them see what potential is there. But would you say surely that, I mean, maybe I'm completely wrong, but the size of the deals that were being signed back then are considerably bigger than, than what the league is signing today? Or is that a completely wrong assumption on my part? <clears throat> um, yes, no, in some way you're right, because, um, I mean, we're moving on to the, the current BBL, but back then, um, sport and the National League and the exposure it was getting was quite extensive. I mean, we used to have a game a week on a Monday night Channel 4 basketball, uh, Monday night basketball, and it was big. And that deal was set up with the head of sport, then was a guy called Adrian Metcalf, exit um, Olympian. And he took in basketball thinking it is going to be the future. So in some way, that's what it started. It was, as I said earlier, it was the sizzle, not the stake that people were following. And they could see this potential in this sport. And that's why we could start to command, you know, reasonable sums. So after the, that, 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 well, when you formed the BBL and it was like, okay, this is happening, kind of that first season, was there any regrets on the side of the club's of breaking away was there any sort of teething problems of trying to go it alone um i'm assuming that certain things changed in terms of the administration and structure of the competition and how things were being done um or was it a case of like this is the best decision we've ever made this is this is exactly what we've wanted to to have have done this whole time <clears throat> no there was teething problems one we didn't have the resources of the staff for a start off that uh, basketball in there i mean they had a staff of probably 20 people in leeds we had dave clark I think Rob Webb, myself, and, and a girl in the office. So it was a struggle, but we did believe it was the right thing to do. And and as it's proved out, it has been the right thing to do. So um, it was a struggle, but we had funding coming in from the existing sponsor that just stepped across the corridor and paid it into the BBL rather than the Basketball Marketing Limited. Then... The year after that, so 1988 was when you set up Bob Ho Productions Limited, right? Which is the TV company, which is, the, which is a kind of in response to a, a what a lack of a lack of TV interest. So that you said, okay, well, we'll do all the production, kind of. Yeah, can you tell me the rationale behind that and how it came about? Yeah. Um, okay. So earlier on, we'd had a big interest. Uh, first of all, in the early days of the National League, the finals from Wembley were televised on BBC. And the Friday night game at the, um, would go on BBC Grandstand. And then the final on the Saturday afternoon from Wembley would be live on BBC Grandstand. So BBC Grandstand were dipping their toe in the water. They were taking those two competitions. Um, then it went to Channel 4. So BBC got pushed to the side and Channel 4 then ran it for like three years, Monday Night Basketball. But then when they pulled out... Uh, we started talking to Sky, who were just developing their uh, media exposure. But it became that we wanted to get back on the BBC. So I said to them, we need to go back to the BBC to see if we can get on there. Now, the BBC personnel had all changed from when in the early days when they were doing it. So I wanted to get in and I couldn't get the editor of the time of Grandstand was John Phillips. He wouldn't even reply to my messages. He wouldn't, he wouldn't respond. He wouldn't talk to me. So I found out that he played golf. So I invited him to play golf. And his secretary came out to me. Barbie gets invited every day to play golf. I said, no, no, I'll come and pick him up. And she said, Bob, he gets picked up every, you know, whenever he wants to play golf, they send a car for him. I said, no, 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 no. I'll pick him up in a helicopter because I know he lives in Battersea. Within 20 minutes, they came back to me and said, yeah, he'll play golf, Bob. Can he bring a guest? And I said, yeah, no problem. So his guest was Des Lynham. So I hired a helicopter. I think it cost about three grand for the day from just outside London, flew into Battersea Heliport, 
picked uh, John Phillips and Des Lyman up and we flew up to Moor Park Golf Club, which had pre-booked the landing space. We had lunch, played golf, and I said to him, John, we've got to get back on the BBC with basketball. He said, Bob, you clash with everything. I've got horse racing, I've got football, I've got everything going on. We have no, we have no facilities. And I said, well, let me do it. And he said, what do you know about television? I said, sod all, but I know a man who does. And he said, I'll tell you what, you do me a pilot. If you can meet the BBC specs, then we'll have another meeting. And he said, I'll give you £19,000 to do the pilot. So I said, great. So I, there was a game gone. I brought in a, a full OB truck, 42 people working on it. I was the executive producer, had never been in television before. And I just sat there and hadn't got a clue what was going on. Let them get on with it. And so the tapes go back to the BBC. Do you remember what the, ga- what the game was? Yeah, it was at Birmingham. It was the Birmingham Bullets versus Crystal Palace, I think. And it went to overtime, which was even better. Funny enough, um, it, we were doing, uh, we had commentators. So we had a bank of commentators. So we're trying to pick the right commentators because we were going to provide everything. So the tapes go back. I get the call from the BBC and they said, OK, you've passed the quality control and all that but because you're not a known company we can't let you do anything live we'll have to send a producer that's that's fine so that's how we started getting back into it and one of the producers they would send uh if we were covering something was a very nice young lady called barbara slater now barbara slater is now the director of bbc sport so I know Barbara extremely well. In fact, Barbara was an international gymnast, a bit later than me, but a lot better than me. So that that went well, and then and then what you were able to then off through that pilot sign the BBC in that that what was that nineteen eighty eight. So that was the the second season of the BBL. <clears throat> it was. They said the BBC would only take really like one event a year, um, but we needed to get into Sky. So we were talking to other companies at the time. So I was getting the situation where I needed to move on. Uh, So I came out of the BBL as the commercial manager and went to see, because I could see another career developing in television. So I could go to other federations and say, you're not on television. Give me your rights. I'll go and get the TV contract and then we'll take a split of the sponsorship. That's a related because you'll get more if it's on television. So I did some amazing events. I was the first to cover the London Triathlon, which ran through the Docklands, which went on the BBC. We did other triathlons from Bath. We did the World Water Ski Championships from Singapore. I did skiff racing from uh, Australia. Um, We did a whole range. We did the World Netball Championships from the National Indoor Arena in Birmingham that went around the world. And... um, so the television became a, a, a different business for me, and that's where I excelled in, in doing that. So what year did you leave the BBL then? Was that after that 88-89 that season? or? It, it was. It was about, yes. I'd be, I only stayed with the BBL for around about a year, um, getting it established. And uh, then it, uh, it um, I think at some stage, a guy called Mike Smith came in as the CEO of the BBL. But Mike was the the manager of the Aston Villa Leisure Centre, where we used to play as the Birmingham Bullets. So uh, I got to know, I know Mike very, really well, and, um, and and he took it to the next level, really. And in those days, uh, when they were doing with Sky, Sky was paying rights fees. Uh, I mean, today, there is no rights fees in television for minority sports, if basketball is classed as a minority sport. Right. So what was your journey? Because obviously now you are the commercial director of the BBL again. You were brought back in a few years ago. So kind of from 88, 89, you obviously went full time, I'm assuming, on, on Bob Hope Productions doing TV production. Um, and then when when did you end up coming back to basketball and getting involved with basketball again? <clears throat> well, I was working um, in Yokohama in Japan um, on a football event, which was Real Madrid versus Boca Juniors, and it was the Toyota Cup. And after the game, I was invited to the FIFA uh, dinner. 
And I ended up sitting next to a, a guy called Mr. Tamiaki, who was the president of the Malton Corporation. And he said to me that he, they are the largest manufacturer in the world of inflatable balls, but they sell none in, in the UK and Ireland and not many parts of Europe. And I said, well, you do now. And he then sent his sales director over to see me in uh, in the UK. I went and showed him a warehouse that I'll buy or hire to start the business going, and they accepted it. And so I, I launched, along with the, I had the Bob Hope TV productions already operating, I launched the Molten Sports brand as well. But also, um, I had another string to my bow, and just to go back. So some years ago, I had a player that I recruited from the States called Greg White. He played for USC. He was six foot eight, a big white player, uh, but very uh, aggressive and very talented player. So he came over and played for me in Birmingham for three years. He ended up marrying uh, a girl from Birmingham. And when he retired, he went back to Los Angeles. And he came over one Christmas to see his wife's family and brought a bag of, I'd say, nut and bolts with me uh, to show me. And he said, Bob, I work for a company called Discog International. We'd like you to run the European operation for this. And I said, Greg, I knew absolutely nothing about nuts and bolts. He said, well, you didn't know anything about television either. So I said, OK. So unfortunately, my wife's uh, father was the managing director of Jaguar Cars in Coventry. So I took these nuts and bolts to show him and there were a unique patented locking device. So he came back to me and said, we've never seen anything like this. So I jumped on a plane, went to Los Angeles, met the owner and acquired the franchise for Europe. So I ran a company called Disc Lock Europe for 26 years and that started from zero turnover. So I eventually sold it in 2016. And that what we did with that product, we developed it into wheel nuts for trucks and buses because wheels come off trucks and buses. <clears throat> and our biggest breakthrough was in the Iraq war. There was a, a trailer, a British Army trailer traveling across the desert with a tank on the back and a wheel came off. And they couldn't find the wheel nuts to put the wheel back on. And they came under attack. And we heard this story. And I went then to the Ministry of Defence and said, look, I can fix that problem. Fit these nuts. You'll never, I'll guarantee you'll never lose a wheel again. And we got a huge contract out of them for wheel nuts. And then that then went on. We did Sainsbury's, the whole Sainsbury's fleet, as the it just mushroomed. So I was now running Bob Hope TV Productions. Dislock into uh, uh, Dislock Europe and Molten Sports. So, what year was so it? it was, I, had a, I had a great. What year was uh, was the Molten uh, deal signed when you became a distributor? What, what sort of a, uh, time were we talking was, about? Uh, it would be around two thousand and five or something like that. Okay, so early two thousands, and then and then yeah. Uh, and so then that was kind of your gig until until being involved with the BBL this time around, or did you do other basketball things in between? Well, <clears throat> no, no, I did lots of basketball things. So first of all, uh, when I got the Molten contract, I wanted to get official ball for the BBL. And they had a deal at the time with a company called Baden, which was Ransom Sporting Goods. And I went to see Mike Smith. In fact, I flew into Birmingham Airport. I was living down in Kent at the time. I flew into Birmingham Airport. He met me there because I'd become a private pilot, so it was a good experience. And uh, we sat down, I said, Mike, I want to become the official ball of the league. And he said, well, we've got another year to run or so with this company. So I said, well, in a year, I want to do it. And I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. So I paid, I offered him quite a substantial chunk of cash to become the official ball. Eventually, after a year, we did. Then we became the official ball for Great Britain, the Basketball Island. I then sponsored the London Youth Games for all the balls, for footballs, from netballs to basketballs to water polo balls, did the whole lot for a number of years to get the brand awareness out there. And then 2012, Molten was the official ball 
for basketball at the Olympics and the Paralympics, which I had a great time working on that. Wow. So, so what, how would you, uh, when you look at the the ball market, because obviously I'm sure you've seen that uh, the NBA has just announced that they're going to be moving away from Spalding and going to Wilson, and w- Wilson seems to be making massive moves to kind of take over the the, the global basketball market. Moulton still have FIBA and the international competitions, and obviously the BBL. Um, kind of how how would you describe the bull market now in the UK and like Baden have almost I mean they barely exist now since they lost that BBL deal right like uh yeah like how would you describe it and what's going on at the moment well it's fairly simple first of all what attracted me to Moulton was it they had a product which was unique and innovative uh the let's talk basketball they brought out a well first of all let's go back so when basketball was came out in the 19 in the 1800s with Naismith it was an eight panel ball so basketball the rules were it has to be an eight panel leather ball Moulton developed a 12 panel leather ball so it put more seams between the panels which gave better fingertip control to the players and dribbling and passing they went to um, FIBA and said we brought this ball out will you change the rules to allow a 12 panel ball to be an official ball FIBA said checked it, tested it. Yes, we will, but you need to pay as a license fee for everyone you sell. So Moulton agreed this, and that was the innovation. So I could easily sell a Moulton basketball against a Spalding or a Wilson, because they're still eight panel balls. And Moulton is a 12 panel ball, and it's unique. So if you see a game of basketball anywhere on TV, you can instantly tell if it's a brown ball, it's either a Wilson or Spalding. But if you see a Moulton, you'll know instantly it's Moulton because it's the unique colours and it's 12 panels. They did the same in football. And Moulton led the, the, the football uh, innovation. They brought out a football with no stitching in it. Each panel was almost welded automatically on a machine, uh, which meant that in wet conditions, it put no weight on So to me, that was a health and safety aspect that I could sell to the schools in this country. So I used to take a bucket of water, some scales into a school's uh, purchasing department and say, look, this is our ball, weigh it, put it into a bucket of water, put a brick on the top, now weigh it again, put zero weight on. Now take your Premier League ball that they play with uh, Nike in the Premier League, which has got stitched, all the water seeps into the stitch mark. It put a quarter of its weight on. So we've got this situation in football where they're trying to stop kids heading the ball because it gets if it's in wet conditions, it's heavier. Our ball never put any weight on at all. And therefore, we could sell it. And what Moulton did was license it to Adidas. So that ball became the World Cup ball, the European Championship ball, uh, and anything that FIFA did internationally was a Moulton made ball, but branded with a FIBA logo. Oh, wow. Interesting. That's a great pub quiz question. <laughs> <laughs> so then, how this time around? Now that you, uh, obviously now now that you're, when did you become uh, back involved with the BBL in this kind of current era? <clears throat> so I in two thousand. Well, first of all, in two thousand and twelve, at the end of the Olympics, I sold the Moulton brand uh, to the for the UK and Ireland to Unicorn Group, who are into Gunnamore cricket, darts, yeah. etc. Uh, which they still run, and they still continue sponsoring the BBL. So then in 2016, I sold the Disclock European company to another company in in the UK and retired. So I retired for a month, and then I got a phone call from Andy Webb saying, Bob, would you like to come back as our commercial director? And I said, I've just retired. He said, yeah, but we're in a bit of a problem we you know we've got very little income coming in we've got no tv exposure uh we're in the shit and i thought oh okay so i said well let me think about it so i spoke to the wife what else am i going to do let's go and have a go at it so i went up to leicester and had breakfast with him and kevin routledge and they persuaded me to get involved with the bbl um to take it on and those days I said well I'm, I don't work in committees so I'm not having a posse of people coming to TV meetings and talking to me or sponsorships and we'll we'll do it so they said 
agreed. They, we agreed a deal and I was to become the commercial director. The first thing I did was visit every British broadcaster because I knew them all from my background in television. I went to see Barbara Slater and we had lunch with Barbara and Barbara said she wanted, she was setting up a new OTT platform from BBC Sport and we could be her first partner. And we did, we became BBC's first partner for the OTT platform. But the most important thing I did was to bring the money in, which the league never knew they had, was the betting rights. So I found out that, and, and I commissioned a, a, a report from a company called Sport Radar. I said to them, does anybody ever bet on basketball? And they came back to me and they said, you have a deal with FIBA Life Stats. So every game that's BBL are playing, somebody's sitting there putting the stats into a computer, which goes out onto the Internet. Unbeknownst to the league, those stats have been bet on around the world. And you would never believe this, that when I started, there was 60 million euros a year being spent on BBL betting and nobody even knew it existed. <laughs> what? 60 million euros of people betting specifically on the BBL? Yeah, so that was when it started. So I went in then and, um, and started talking to all these betting integrity companies. So it's not 365 bet. There's a middleman and it's they're the integrity companies that guarantee there's no cheating. So it's Perform Group, it's Sport Radar, it's Genius Sport, it's these sort of people. And we did a deal with um, Perform, which was substantial money cash coming into the league, which took the, turned the league around. And so when I came in in 2016, the league was losing money. It was losing around 120,000 a year on TV, on an OTT platform called BBL TV. Yeah. So I cancelled that. Stopped that. That was a waste of money. That's going out the tube. So how many <clears> subscribers <throat> did BBL TV get? I might ask you whilst we've got you. I'm not really sure, but I, it wasn't many. Yeah. Uh, I, I know. I think the income was 20 grand, and they were spending 140 grand doing the production. I mean, it was just. Yeah. nonsensical you know it's a me it was an odd starter so that's where that all changed and um it uh with the perform money took the lead from in the red to being in the black how many years was that perform deal it was a multi-year deal right it's three-year deal so we've just we're started um so last this last season or the current season was the start of a new three-year deal so we completed the three-year deal and we've just concluded the first year so there's two more years to run on that but i learned i learned a lot because what we were selling perform was the exclusive betting video rights so i started thinking about what about non-exclusive betting data rights and that's another that's another ball game. That's another customer. So I went off to see Sport Radar and sold them the non-exclusive data rights for for the games. So what they could they could do they could take a video. I could give them a video feed of every game into their London office, and they would sit down and do statistics from it. They couldn't use the video feed to give to the betting uh, industry, but they could do statistics. What they turned out wanting to do, they send in a, a person to all BBL games, and he sits there in the crowd with his computer doing the statistics, sending them out live on the internet. So that's how they set, they make their money on selling betting from BBL games. And because it's a non-exclusive and it's not video, it was accepted by Perform. So this, this whole betting thing, like, I mean, 60 million euros a year on the BBL, people betting sounds crazy numbers to me. Uh, like... That, I mean, I'm assuming that can't be people that are BB. It's not like people that are BBL fans. It's just people that are betting fans, and they can find something <coughs> random to bet on where they feel like they can make money, right? Yeah, the the, the biggest market was the Philippines. I found out. Wow. So it was the Philippines, the Middle East. Uh, it wasn't this country. Yeah. It was all around the world. Uh, in fact, I, I still have that report from Sport Radar that we didn't even know existed. That is unbelievable. Um. 
Okay, so you've obviously done that. Now, the, the one thing that you know we all talk about when we're talking about British basketball is TV, right? And getting on, getting on, uh, sort of ideally free to air TV on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> you clearly have all the relationships with, you know, numerous um, big broadcasters, but we're still not in a situation where the BBL can get a regular TV slot. Why do you think that is? What are the barriers that you're facing when you're trying to sell it um, to the broadcast and getting it on mainstream TV? Well, the biggest barrier is called Premier League football because <laughs> they've sucked every pound out of the British broadcasting companies in rights fees and production fees. So now we're faced with a situation where I can go to a major broadcaster, let's say a Channel 4 again, and say to Channel 4, we'll give you a live game a week. And they'll say, well, we'll take it. We're not paying a rights fee and we can't pay a production fee. Well, I don't see there is another way around that where we could say to them, well, we'll take the sponsorship around the broadcast. But that's another that's a bit more difficult to do. So you go to Sky today. They won't pay any production or, or rights fees. Nobody will. And it's not just us. It's, it's all that, the sports below the Premier League football, really. And, it, and it's. it's so frustrating so you've got to come up with ideas where we need the exposure we need the exposure for to grow the fan base to grow the participation level and to bring in more revenue so we came up with the idea last year that we put every game on you on youtube so it's free to everybody and i'm fortunate i've got twin boys who are now 22 and I sat down with them and I said, how do we get the exposure of basketball? And they said, well, if you're looking for our age group, we don't pay for sport. We won't buy Sky. We won't pay for BT. We need it free. We need it on any device and we need it live. OK, so that's so you can have BBC. So you can put on the BBC Sports website. You could go YouTube. BBC is slight problem because it's geo blocked. So it's not worldwide available. If we want worldwide really the easiest one is YouTube. But we provide the production to do YouTube and then we put it out onto YouTube. It's not the best way of doing it because we don't get the data of who watches it. So we're now thinking about, can we get exposure out there for free that we can gather the data? And we're in discussions with a number of companies at the moment who are prepared to do this. I also want the production quality to be upgraded it is not good at the moment uh, and I've been advocate I've been a, a, a pioneer really for automated TV into basketball <clears throat> some of it's doable but some of it's not so it needs upgrading one we don't get replays we need replays we need highlights packages quicker we need more social media interface into it so I've got a whole list of things to do that I'm trying to fix yeah, it's funny. I was actually going to bring up the key motion stuff because for me, it's been one of my biggest frustrations this season is that, you know, certain games in certain venues, like watching it is just painful. Like the production quality is just not there. Um, I guess kind of what like is that is that deal a multi year deal? Like, do you see key motion being involved again next season or is that something you're going to move away from? Go back to sort of manually um, managed cameras by people? No, uh, key motions is a is a multi year deal. But what's built into the system is upgrades. So every arena that's got the system, there's a socket on the wall where you can plug in a manned camera. So I want to be able to plug in manned cameras to do interviews before the game. Then that manned camera becomes camera two on the production. So he does the close ups and then he becomes the uh, do the interviews at the end of the game. So that man camera needs to be paid for. It's a man and a camera. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we need to raise some money for to do. I can add two cameras to it. You can do multiple cameras eventually, but it's something we're doing because of the, the constraints of, of uh, the costings. It's it's something we need to do in the future. Right. And is there, is there like in terms of what, what's the company saying in terms of, for example, you know, when a player breaks away on the fast break and they're they're, they're moving quickly and they're breaking away from the pack, it, it always seems the camera's a bit too slow to keep up with the play. So we almost miss it a, a lot of times. And also it's very, very zoomed out. Like, is there conversations about them improving that, that 
just that single camera view and, and making it so it's a little bit more watchable? Yes, there is. Um, so what they do at the moment, the cameras are programmed. So it's a single camera that sits on in the roof on the halfway line. The camera doesn't move it. So it's a wide lens. It's move, It's done digitally. And that camera tracks 10 players. So an example was if you've got a foul shot at one end, it zooms in because all 10 players are over the halfway line. It zooms in. But if one of those players goes back to the other end of the court on defense, the cameras are a plan a, a program to track out right. to keep 10 players in shot. That's what we're working on to eliminate. What they should be doing is tracking the ball more than the 10 players. Yeah. So all these things are tweakable and that's what we're working on at the moment. But I also want replays, um, not just replays on site. I want to be able to send you, you could be watching this on your iPhone and you'll say, there's a great move. You can freeze it up with your finger. You can swipe back, see it. And that's great. And you can then send that to your social media. So I've just seen this move. It's on live now from wherever Sheffield. And that's what the next stage of the, the game is to do is to get that technology it's all there it's just bringing it together but there is a cost involved which we're hoping to be able to get over do you think if the if the production quality improves and you get to a, a point that it is like almost broadcast quality you're then in a situation where you can go back to tv <clears throat> t, tv stations and say well actually we've got all the production costs covered all you need to do is take it yeah it's not broadcast quality at the moment um you can add cameras to it and you can enhance it. It's more OTT. It's a streaming quality uh, platform. If we go back to, uh, well, let's give you an example. So uh, the cup final uh, in January from Birmingham was live on the BBC. That wasn't done on automated TV cameras because the quality isn't good enough for the BBC to show on their terrestrial channels. So we then bring in a full OB truck with cameras and do it that way. So. It's going to be very difficult to go away from that if you want that type of quality. When you talk about the state of the sort of the commercial side of the league as a whole, um, how close do you think we are to potentially signing, you know, big uh, league changing deals, whether it's a title sponsor or, or whatever else that um, could, you know, drastically change the future of the sport? Close. We're working on some really substantial deals. Uh, obviously, COVID's slowed it down, um, but it's close. What we need is, and the league hasn't had a league sponsor, I think, for over 10 years. So that's something we need. Now, bearing in mind, I used to be a sponsor, so I can sit on that side of the fence as well. So I can see, well, what do I sell these sponsors to get them to come in to become a league sponsor? And you've got to give them the benefit. They've got to have a good business plan of we're going to give them exposure, we're going to give them brand awareness, uh, access into the junior development program. So it's, we are working on a program like that. And we have been into umpteen meetings with potential uh, sponsors about it. So I would think within, depending on when we get the league back playing again, but within the next 12 months, there'll be a huge injection of cash coming into the league wow are you allowed to tell us any any more about the specifics of where that cash might be coming from no <laughs> not, <laughs> no because it, it would be silly for me to get into that because it could it could you know compromise the deal so yeah uh but it, it, it's a number it's not one uh company that we're talking to it's a number of initiatives that we're trying to do um and we've got a lot of companies, particularly like, you know, the sport radar company, uh, want to develop our OTT platform and bring it more market for free to the, the public. So there's lots going on. And, and although we've got no league running at the moment, I'm quite busy. And I'm, only, I'm on this every day full time at the moment. What do you think uh, maybe the biggest barriers the league faces to these commercial deals like if you if you were to look at it objectively and say you know you go into a meeting with a with a huge brand um and they look at the league you know what are, is it exposure is it something else is it the standard like kind of when you're talking about that maybe the negatives or the downsides of the bbl from a from a commercial standpoint what would you say those are well nowadays it's social media what what are the eyeballs is the question i get how many eyeballs you got 
So we need to address that and we need to start looking at uh, the people, the younger generation who we're after, they consume little clips. They don't want to sit there for two hours watching an entire game. They want clips and then they can pass that onto their social media. So it's all about eyeballs looking at the league, looking at the sport and using that social media. -wise. Social media is where this is going to be driven. And what we don't have at the moment, we don't have the facility to collect the data from that social media. So what we want to do is if we had an OTT platform, all you need to do is provide us with your email address. We'll have a BBL app, you download it, and that app will then tell you when your game's coming on. It'll give you all the information you'll need. You can even buy a basketball from the BBL shop, etc. But we've got that data and then we can hit those people to say, by the way, this is available next week or do you want a ticket for the playoffs and you know at the moment it's a limited data that we have and that's what we need to attack and which we're, what we're working on and then i'm aware of time here because I've got, I've got to shoot for a call in a minute um but just just finally uh when we talk about um covid and coronavirus and the sort of the the shutdown the impact on on the <clears> league can you talk about kind of the impact it's had on the league um, and maybe the future impact, how you see the league potentially returning uh, and yeah, what, what is, what, what's going to be the sort of, what's going to be left afterwards? Well, with COVID, obviously it's decimated sport worldwide and it's decimated sport a lot bigger than us. So the Premier League, biggest league in the world has been killed at the moment. So we're just sitting on the coat strings of that to see what they do. Now, they could go and uh, they start playing behind closed doors, and that's to recoup the revenue they'll get from the media exposure. But as I said earlier, we don't get any media exposure revenue. So therefore, playing behind closed doors is a non-starter for the BBL. Um, so we just need to sit and wait um, to see where it's going. I mean, lockdown is being lifted gradually. There's lots of talk on TV every day about viruses, uh, not viruses, that the vaccines coming out. You know, it, it, things are moving. People, a lot of people out there are working to get this country and the world back to normal. So we just have to take it easy. It, we're hoping to start the league in September. It may not start in November, but we'll still continue to play the same amount of games over that period of time. So we'll still uh, look to running as a normal uh, league, but we can't do it behind closed doors. It's not viable at all. Do you think there's um there's the likelihood is uh that well we I don't know whether you heard the they heard the interview with um former BBL director David Lowe on the MVP cast with Mark Woods and he was talking about the BBL is at risk of a potential insolvency event. Do you think that that is actually a, a real thing that's possible, or do you think that the league and its franchises are safe? I think the league and the franchise are safe because David Lowe hasn't been a member of the BBL board I think now for most of a year. Uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about, to be honest. He has no idea what we're talking about, what I'm doing on a daily basis. So I've got every faith that this league will be solvent uh, and continue and thrive. So we're looking to bring in more franchises to take this league up to eventually 16 teams in the league. So a lot of work going on. But David Lowe's not privy to any of that. So um, his statement, I heard them, is stupid. Fair enough. Um, just a quick one. Uh, you mentioned there's 16 franchises. How soon do you think that could happen if, if we're talking about the sort of uh, an increase in, in number of teams in the league? Well, the light, we have a license with the British Basketball Federation for 10 years. And that license uh, is suggesting and cohesion co that we get to 16 teams in the 10 years. So we've got seven more years to go. Now, we may not get to 16 but we'd, we'd love to get a franchise back in Birmingham. The grassroots are already there. Remember, 40-odd years ago, I took professional basketball to Birmingham, so I'd love it to get back into Birmingham. So we are looking and talking on a regular basis to potential um, people to come up to, to have a franchise to get back into the, uh, the BBL. Perfect. Cool. I think that is a perfect place to leave it because I have to shoot. Bob, it's been super insightful. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. No, it's no problem. Thanks very much.